All right, everybody. So we are going to talk about our final type or, or cause of postoperative fever, and that is wonder drugs or wonder slash drugs. So uh, this is kind of a catch-all, uh, but it is important to know that there are drugs that can cause fever. Um, there uh, are uh, transfusions that can cause fever. Blood transfusions can cause fever. And the wonder... Um, I'm not exactly sure where that comes from, but uh, one surgeon that I worked around said, wonder where. And what they're referring to there is a cryptic abscess, which can develop during surgery. If you get any kind of infection uh, during the surgery, um, it can be localized and can develop an abscess and you don't necessarily know where it's at. Um, and so that can cause post-operative fever, especially in the very long term. Uh, but what we're primarily going to be focusing on here are drugs that can cause fever, uh, generally intraoperatively as we talk about malignant hyperthermia, and then we'll talk about a couple transfusion reactions. And I'm going to limit this to things that come up uh, regularly on your exam. These are pretty high yield things. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the i button in the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. Definitely subscribe to my channel and you will get notifications each and every time I put a new video up. All right, so we are here. And um, we're going to be talking about drugs that cause fever, namely uh, malignant hyperthermia, and then we'll talk about transfusion reactions. Yes, I know blood transfusion is not a drug, but it is something we give the patient similar to drugs. All right, so this is what we're going to be talking about. Now, uh, I had included this actually... Um, I think I might have included in a previous video, somebody had mentioned um, that a big cause of postoperative fever in the immediate term, you know, within the first couple days is cytokine release. And that is a really good point. Um, the problem is um, that's really difficult to test. Um, the only way I can imagine it coming up is um, that they'll tell you 12 hours after surgery, patient develops fever, what's the most likely cause? And that would be cytokine release. Um, now I know um, in my um, in my talk on uh, wind, I, um, I talk about atelectasis as the cause of fever. Atelectasis does not always cause fever, uh, but it can lead to pneumonia, which certainly can cause fever, always causes fever actually. Um, so, it is important to keep that in mind, but do bear in mind also that cytokine release um, due to tr the trauma of the surgery can lead to uh, a postoperative fever. All right, so malignant hyperthermia. This is a type of drug fever. Um, there are a number of drug fevers. There are some drugs that have fever as a side effect. You will not be expected to know those, but malignant hyperthermia is so important for you to know. And fortunately, it is fairly straightforward. So um, malignant hyperthermia is a reaction to an anesthetic agent, and it's going to be one of two things. It's either going to be the inhaled volatile anesthetic like sevoflurane, uh, or it'll be due to the succinylcholine, which we give uh, as a paralytic agent. Now, one thing that does come up, especially on step one, is they'll give you a vignette of a patient with malignant hyperthermia, and then they're going to ask you what's the underlying cause. And yes, it is the medication that triggered it, uh, but this can run in families, and it's actually due to a mutation of the ryanidine receptor, which is a calcium channel, and um, because this mutation is inherited, it's going to be important that you ask the patient prior to the surgery, uh, do, do, has anyone in your family had any kind of reaction during surgery um, that caused the surgeon to have to stop the surgery? Um, they might not know the term malignant hyperthermia, so just ask about parents with complications. And it's really parents or siblings um, that we are concerned about because this is an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. Um, usually this will develop during the surgery, but you can develop malignant hyperthermia after the surgery. Usually it's within hours. Symptoms, the two big ones or three big ones that you need to know are fever, rigidity, and myoglobinuria. So you've got a patient who's getting uh, surgery, and then the anesthesiologist notes that they're, they're, 
they went from 98 and then you administer the anesthesia and now they're 100 and rising. That is concerning. Another thing that can help you confirm this is myoglobinuria. Now, that's not always going to be present, but on a test vignette, it could be uh, given to you. Now, it is important for you to know the difference between malignant hypothermia and something else that can cause fever due to drugs, and that's neuroleptic malignant syndrome. The big thing there, even though it's very similar as far as presentation, these patients have a history of being on antipsychotics, which, as we know, are dopamine antagonists, and that causes the neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Malignant hyperthermia is associated with anesthetic drugs. Diagnosis here is clinical. This is an emergency. We do not have time to do lab tests. So what we're going to do is you've got a patient with fever and rigidity during the surgery. Um, you are going to immediately give them dantrolene and then stop the surgery. Acute hemolytic. Oh, by the way, very important. Let's say you've got a patient that is getting surgery and they develop severe hypertension. We're talking 200 systolic, even more than that. What are we concerned about? We are concerned about the possibility of an undiagnosed pheochromocytoma. And um, one in a thousand people have a pheochromocytoma. And a thousand people is actually roughly the number of people that you will cross on a daily basis. So even though it's uncommon, uh, it happens. Um, so with that hypertension, um, what we uh, will typically see is uh, that these patients do not respond to really powerful uh, antihypertensive drugs like nitroprusside. And as a matter of fact, what we need to do for these patients, what we always do for patients who are going to resect a pheochromocytoma is give an alpha blocker. And that would be your drug of choice if you suspect a cryptic pheochromocytoma. That can be very deadly. Okay, acute hemolytic reaction. Um, basically, what's happening here is that you give the patient the wrong blood type, their antibodies attack that blood and causes a reaction. Uh, this can be very problematic, uh, but the problem with this is that um, on an exam question, it's going to be really hard for you to know um, what is going on. So what you need to look for here is, yes, the fever, but also red-colored urine, um, due to the release of hemoglobin into the plasma, that's going to make its way to the kidneys and then to the urine. Um, and then these patients can actually develop hypotension as you can get a minor allergic reaction from this. Diagnosis here is clinical. Make sure you're getting a CBC. Make sure, because DIC can develop, uh, make sure you're getting electrolytes. And then at the very least, get uh, bilirubin. Because as you know, with hemolysis, your indirect bilirubin is going to be elevated. You can also get LDH. That could be useful to you too. Uh, the treatment here is to stop the transfusion, and then we want to make sure that we're doing our best to prevent kidney injury. Uh, hemoglobin uh, in the serum is nephrotoxic, so we want to flush those kidneys out, generous fluids, um, and we want to uh, put Put a Foley in, monitor their urine output. You know, you want half a milliliter to one milliliter of urine per minute. Um, so monitor the urine output. If they're not making enough urine, then you're going to diurese them. The best diuretic here is mannitol. Febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reactions is basically a fever after you give blood. Now, in the immediate term, it can be very difficult to differentiate from an acute hemolytic reaction. And so oftentimes what's going to happen here is that we need to stop the transfusion until we can make sense of what's happening. And so, of course, to distinguish these, at the very least, you want to get a bilirubin level. If the bilirubin level is normal, if they're not hemolyzing, then we can exclude an acute hemolytic reaction and we settle on this FNHTR, which um, typically only fever is, uh, is present. Um, and so at that point, you can recontinue the transfusion. This is a benign process here. This is not going to cause any serious problems for you uh, other than the fever. And you can give, uh, you know, antipyretics as needed. Um, but um, this is a, a pretty benign uh, issue. But it, it does come up on exams as something um, that is uh, this versus an acute hemolytic reaction. So know, know the difference. These are some of the other causes of postoperative fever. 
I want to draw your attention to a calculus cholecystitis as a possible complication of giving total parenteral nutrition and alcohol withdrawal. Very, very important. Um, if, uh, if you're going to be operating on somebody, you need to know if they're an alcoholic because they're going to be hospitalized for some time. We don't want them to go into withdrawal. And that goes for any hospitalized alcoholic. Um, lorazepam or Librium are fine to give these patients to prevent that. And these are some of your clinical strategies. Communication is really key. Um, you can uh, go over this as you wish, but this likely will not come up on your exam.